this week we're returning to the Sermon on the Mount. And once again, as we're going to see, Jesus takes us back to school. Last week, we talked about loving your enemies, something that's not very easy to do. And this week, we're going to talk about judging others, which is something that is hard not to do. Now, often when I'm doing my sermon preparation, I'll go back through my old sermon files and see what I said about a text the last time I preached on it. And I've been doing this long enough now that, that I've preached on pretty much every major text that you can imagine, and some of them many, many times. So I just assumed that I had preached on this, and what I discovered when I went back and looked is that I've never once preached a sermon on Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. I've referenced it in sermons before, and I can, I can tell that because I can go back and clear back into the early 90s. I've got files that old, and I can do a quick search and find out if I did, and I hadn't. I've referenced it, but never actually preached a whole sermon. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but I, I have a working theory. And, uh, and, and I think the, the reason is, is because this text has been abused so often and, and, and so much. When Jesus said, do not judge or judge not lest ye be judged, he opened up a, a whole can of worms, really, in a lot of ways. Several commentators I was reading this week pointed out that even people who don't know anything else about the Sermon on the Mount, or really even the Bible, seem to know about this one verse and will quote it to you uh, if, if they feel like they're being judged in any kind of a negative way. Sometimes it's used, this verse is used like a kind of a get out of jail free card, right? If somebody feels like they're being judged, they can say, judge not, judge not, Jesus said so, it's right there in the Bible. But I don't think Jesus gave us this text as some kind of a shield against criticism. That's not what it's there for. He gave it to us, just like he did the one about loving your enemies, because he's calling us to a deeper and a more authentic faith. Right? As Jesus says in the, in, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, right, in those opening verses, he expects our righteousness to be to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, the ones that are most concerned about following the law, about righteousness. Our righteousness, our goodness, is to exceed even that. Uh, so, yes, Jesus said, judge not. But, uh, but as we're going to see in the rest of, uh, of this text, there's, there's more to it. And, and I think the further into it we read, the more it begins to make sense. So let's take a look at Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. Jesus says, Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you say, why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not see the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. I have an old friend back in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, his name is Merle. And uh, one, of my, one of my favorite elders at the church that I used to serve. And, and uh, funny, funny guy. We'd, whenever we would talk about current events, I could almost always count on him to say something like this. Everyone in this world is crazy, except for me and thee. And then there'd be a long pause, and he'd grin, and he'd point at me, and he'd say, and I'm beginning to wonder about thee. And I laughed every time he said that. I knew it was coming. But I also laugh because I think for a lot of people, that is how we approach the world. We assume the best about ourselves, and we assume the worst about others. In social psychology, there, this, there's a name for this. It's called fundamental attribution error. I knew there was a name for it, but I couldn't, for the life of me, I couldn't remember it. That's what Google is for. So I looked it up. That's what it is. And what it means... Is, uh, is, is that when somebody else does something wrong or when they make a mistake, we tend to attribute that to a flaw in their character. 
Okay? In other words, they did what they did because they're a bad person and they have bad motives. When we do the same thing, when we make a mistake or when we do something wrong, we attribute it to circumstances, circumstances outside our control. It wasn't my fault or I didn't know or whatever. When Jesus says, judge not lest ye be judged, he's not telling us that we need to stop thinking critically about the world. Jesus wants us to use discernment. He wants us to use our brains. He, uh, he, he wants us to distinguish between good and evil. He doesn't want us to turn a blind eye to sin or to injustice. But he also wants us to turn that critical eye on ourselves. That's what this is about. If we consistently judge others more harshly than we judge ourselves, that's a problem. I, I ran across a quote this week by a, a, an, a, an Anglican bishop from the late 1800s by the name of J.C. Ryle. And, uh, and he had a, just a, a quote that I found about this particular verse that I liked. And the, the language is kind of archaic, but I like how it sounds. He writes... What our Lord means to condemn is a censorious and fault-finding spirit, a readiness to blame others for trifling offenses or matters of indifference, a habit of passing rash and hasty judgments, a disposition to magnify the errors and infirmities of our neighbors and make worst of them. This is what our Lord forbids. And then he finishes by saying, it was common among the Pharisees. And it was. We know from reading the Gospels that the Pharisees literally followed Jesus around just waiting for him to make a mistake. Right? To break some obscure food law or kosher law or to heal somebody on the Sabbath. All while ignoring the things that are most important to God. Missing the whole point. Because they're so concerned about these little mistakes that they believe Jesus was making. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus warns, actually that whole chapter, Jesus takes the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees on. But in this one verse, he says this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You tithe mint, dill, and cumin. In other words, I mean, these are, nowadays, these are spices we find in our kitchen cabinets, Right? What he's saying is that you are so concerned about tithing that you're going to make sure you give even the 10% of the, of the spices in your kitchen cabinet. That's how careful you are about your tithe. And yet you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice and mercy and faith. You've ignored the big things because you're so focused on the little things. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. He's not saying you should neglect the others. But pay attention to the big things first. The Pharisees, and this is the thing, I, I, you know, I, I see it even today. They, they thought they were right with God and they were right where they, God wanted them to be. And the reason they thought that was because they were outraged all the time at others. Jesus' disciples weren't washing their hands properly. That's outrageous, right? Or Jesus healed somebody on the Sabbath. He could have waited until the next morning to do that. That's outrageous. Everywhere they looked, people weren't keeping the law up to their standards. I once heard somebody describe this as majoring in minors. That's what they were doing. It's not that the Pharisees were even wrong about what they were seeing. It's just that they were missing that bigger picture. They saw the sin and the shortcomings in everyone but themselves. And they failed to value what God values more than anything else. Justice and mercy and faith. Now, if you're quick to judge others and you have a keen eye for seeing the sins of the world, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. I think the prophets often had that ability really, really well. And it could even help you identify where you need, need to be putting some, you know, expending some, some energy in ministry in the world. But when you discover by looking at yourself that your faith 
is being expressed primarily as outrage and anger all the time when the whole world is going crazy except for me and thee and you're not so sure about thee? There's really only one antidote to that. Jesus nails it on the head. You need to turn that critical eye, your critical eye, on yourself. It's time for that. You have to stop worrying about the splinter in the other guy's eye, and you need to start grappling with the log in your own eye. For, for years, there's a, a quote. I had to look it up again, though, to see who did it. By a guy named Thomas Shepard. He was a Puritan in 16, the year 1640, and he said three words. And, and this comes to me almost every time I think about judging others. He said, suspect thyself much. I love that. Suspect thyself much. In other words, even when you think you've taken that log out of your own eye, you might want to check again. Just assume that you are judging people more harshly than you're judging yourself, because you probably are. We don't like to look all that carefully at ourselves. It's just hard for us to do. We want to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt most, most of the time. When I was in seminary, I, I took a couple of classes on pastoral care and, and counseling, which doesn't make, never made me into a, a, a counselor, but occasionally I get calls from people that, that are looking to, to talk, get some help. And I can remember early on in my ministry um, when I wasn't all that experienced. I had a, a woman call, set up an appointment, and she came in. And, uh, and as we began to talk, I, I could tell right away that she really, all she really wanted to talk about was how much her husband needed to change. That's what she wanted to talk about. And so I said, after, after talking for a while, I said, well, I, I'm not sure I can really help you with that. But uh, I said, we can talk about you how you might change. Needless to say, she was not interested in that at all. I don't, in fact, I'm not sure I ever even saw her again after that. I'd probably handle that a little differently now that I've been doing this for a while. But I, I did learn something important from that encounter, and that is that most people aren't interested in thinking critically about themselves or about how they might change for the better. They're really not that interested in that, and it's too bad. Because as any counselor or therapist will tell you, that's the path to emotional and spiritual maturity. Judge others, and you will be judged, just like Jesus says, but you'll also remain stuck right where you're at. Suspect thyself much, do some of that work on yourself, and you will grow in ways that you might never have imagined before. But you've got to do that tough work. This past week, I've been, I've been thinking about how this idea of judging others ties into one of my favorite parables. And this was a, a story that came up when I was at junior camp a couple of weeks ago. The parable of uh, the, the wedding banquet. And you, you might remember the story. Jesus said, once upon a time, there was a, a king whose son was to be married. And uh, so the, the king sends out invitations to all of his best friends and to his supporters to come to the wedding feast. When none of them respond and none of them come, he's, he's very disappointed. That's another part of the story. But, uh, but what he does is he sends his servants out into the streets and he says, just bring everybody in. We're going to invite everyone to come to this party. And that's what they do. They open up the doors and everyone comes to the party. But then this parable takes kind of a dark turn. And, uh, and again, you might remember that uh, uh, the king shows up at the party and he sees that some of the people aren't dressed properly and he kicks them out. Kicks them out of the party. And I can remember reading that a long time ago and thinking to myself, well, that's not really very fair, is it? They just got brought in off the street. How are they supposed to be dressed properly for this wedding feast? And then a few years later, I heard a sermon by uh, Fred Craddock, great disciple preacher, and, uh, and everything kind of came into focus for me. And what he said was that what this parable is really about, it's about our role as the king's servants in God's kingdom. Our job, just like it was the job of the servants in the story, is to invite and to include 
and to love everyone. That's our job. Open up the door and bring them in. God's job is to judge who's dressed properly and who's not. In other words, not our job. We don't get to stand at the door and determine who gets in and who doesn't. Not our job. One of the reasons that we're not, that's not our job is because we're not qualified. We're not qualified to make those judgments. We can't see a person's heart. We don't know their motives. Likewise, we don't always know a person's background or their history. We're not qualified. We never will be. The only one we're even remotely qualified to judge is ourselves. So that's always going to be the best starting place for us. Suspect thyself much. Right? Even, even when you're tempted not to suspect yourself much. But again, I would also add, don't check your brain at the door either. God gave us the gift of discernment and He expects us to use it. And I say that even more strongly now than I think I ever have because I realized in my study this week that in the verse immediately following where we finished reading today, which was Matthew 7 verses 1 through 5, in verse 6 Jesus says this, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. What's he saying there? He's saying, use your head. Use discernment. I don't think the placement of this, of this verse is a coincidence. It's almost as, as if Jesus is saying, don't be judgmental, but don't bang your head against a brick wall either. Don't be silly. Sometimes we need to know when to dust off our sandals and move on. Walking away is sometimes the best strategy. Yes, you shouldn't be judgmental, but you shouldn't put yourself in harm's way either. So the, the whole point, I think, of this text, if I had to kind of summarize it, and Pastor Brian asked me that earlier today, what's the point of this text or this sermon? And I said, what you put out into the world is what you get back. So you've got to be careful about what you're putting out there. The Beatles had a song uh, and in it they said, in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. In other words, if you're constantly finding fault in others, that's what you can expect to return, in return. Jesus said, the measure you give will be the measure you get. Now, I don't know about you, but I know how I got, want God to deal with me. I want the full measure of God's forgiving and healing love. I want all the mercy and grace. That's what I want. And as hard as it sometimes is to do this, I know that the path to that happy ending, to that mercy and that grace, goes directly through my neighbor. If I want God to deal gently and mercifully with me, then I'd better be doing the same for everybody else. It really is that simple. As I said last week, it's easy enough to understand on the surface, but this is graduate level in terms of application. If we're talking about school, this is graduate level application-wise. So suspect thyself much. Never stop doing that. Work on the log in your own eye before trying to perform surgery on your neighbor's eye. And love like Jesus did. Because the measure you give will be the measure you get. Let's pray. Lord, once again, we come humbly recognizing how difficult it is to follow in Jesus' footsteps, how difficult it is to, even if we understand the meaning of his words, to actually apply them in real life. We are quick to judge others, not always so quick to look at ourselves. Help us to love. Help us to deal gently and mercifully with people that you might deal gently and mercifully with us. Help us to love like Jesus does because we pray this all in his name. Amen.